And now we're back already with Impact TV with a new guest. I would like to give a warm welcome to Munir Samuel. Good evening, everyone. Um, just a short recap for those who, in case that people don't know, uh, Munir is a multidisciplinary performance artist and author of fiction and non-fiction books, a lot I heard, a creative consultant and a public speaker, and his work operates on the crossroads and interactions of religion, gender, sex, politics, culture, climate, and creative power in social revolutionary change. And we've just watched your very inspiring and refreshing keynote lecture. Yeah, I, I found many people also on, in, at the bar very astonished by the boldness of my super unconventional speech. I can totally imagine, because <laughs> I don't, don't think a lot of people expect a story to be about the genesis yes. and the, the origin story of man to be this provocative, can yes, I say that? Yes, I guess. That, yeah. Look, I have a very special position, I guess, because mm -hmm. I am both revolutionary to believers and non-believers alike. Yeah. So for any Christian who would watch that Genesis talk, or any Muslim for that matter, because Adam and Eve story is also um, a, a Quranic story as well, or any religious Jew, my um, reconstruct, deconstruction of the Genesis story is very provocative, so if not shocking, if not blasphemous. It depends on <laughs> how you look at it. But then I found this audience not religious at all. It is very new to them, although I'm using such an old story, to hear religion being brought back in the cultural and art space like that. And I think my work is, um, is, is very different in that way. And I haven't found anyone else doing the same thing. It, but it's also because it's really driven from the heart. Hmm. There is a biblical verse that says, in you, which is God, I am, I move, and I have my being. And I really feel this. So even if I don't want to talk about God, I, ended up, I end up doing so because it's just, it's really my heartbeat somehow. My, this is my creative thing. It's that breath of God. It's just, I can create without, without the creator, I guess. So that's, that's how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what, what fascinates me, what I'm very interested in, mm. is that you bring this interpretation and mm. you say, well, we don't understand this correctly. We should think differently about this idea that Adam was, was masculine, that Adam is actually both masculine and feminine. Yeah, the first that human, is, not the first man, for yeah. example. And um, could you tell me a bit more on your, your study or your, your how you get to that interpretation mm. or the work that you do to yeah, bring that new perspective? Okay, so... I love reading the Bible. I think it's one big love letter to humanity, and I think it is an inspiration for freedom. Mm -hmm. So for me, I, I read it not as a source of moral guidance or law. I, I read it as a book of freedom and wisdom and answers to tomorrow. So I feel way better prepared, for example, to the times and the problems we're facing right now, because it's literally the Bible book of Revelations happening as we speak. Um, so I also really read it for, in order to read the day. Uh, and when you think of the Bible as that, as a life-giving book, in, in Arabic it's called Kutub al Hayatis, the books that give life, mm. and that gives life in different times to different people and has fresh revelation to you and to me every single time we read the text, then of course you will look to, to that same source for all your big life questions, right? So one of my big questions is, what does it mean to be a man? And how can be, I be a man? And I ask hundreds and hundreds of men, what it means to be a man. None of them ever knew how to define what being a man is without referring to the genitals, mm. for, so having a dick, or calling everything that they are that is not female or non-woman. So they will say, it's being not. And then they will, will define themselves as opposed to women. For me, that was not a good answer. I don't want to be a non-woman for being a man, and I cannot refer to my genitals as a birth-given right for my masculinity as being a transgender man. So then I thought, okay, so, but I do really feel male. I am a male, but then how can I redefine masculinity beyond those two limited constructs that men have of their own masculinity? And so I started looking in the Bible for a new idea of masculinity, and then you go to the first man, what you think, what you have learned to be the first man, to only find out he wasn't a man at all. 
So <laughs> that was very interesting. And, and so I kept reading and I kept looking and I kept searching for God and also trying, trying to understand the Bible better. So for example, what I find very interesting is God in Hebrew is often called the womb. And uh, and the word Rahman, Rahim, what, what the Muslims use when they pray, the, the benevolent one, actually comes from that word womb. So God is even described as a womb that grows us. Now, there's much less more feminine, I wouldn't say female, but feminine than a womb that grows and gives birth to new life, right? So I, that completely started changing my ideas on what masculinity and femininity means, what God is, what we are. And, and so I, I kept searching and looking and I kept reading. And every day I, I, I tried to reread the Bible as it is. And I go back to Genesis and start, try to understand the start because it has such a profound impact on our society. I really think we, we, we don't understand how important the Bible is for our society today. Our Dutch was developed in order to translate the Bible. They chose the Dutch of Haarlem as the language for all of us to read and speak to know the Bible by ourselves after the Reformation. Same counts for English. English was only, there were many different dialects that we could consider kind of English, but we wouldn't understand it today. It was created and standardized for the King James Version of the Bible. So our language was created in order to read the Holy Text. Hmm. Then our law system is completely based on the Bible. What we consider wrong and right is completely based on religious doctrine. Our ideas of what women can do and not do for centuries, centuries, was proclaimed in name of God. So we cannot deconstruct femininity as it is, or our notion of womanhood, without looking how was it created in the first place, and on the basis of what text and what interpretation. Mm -hmm. In that sense, religion became political, and so you cannot talk about politics without looking at the impact of religion. You mentioned language, yes. and that makes me curious, in which language do you read the Bible? So, for a very long time, I read it in Dutch, and I was, I was raised in the Bible Belt, but every time I would open the Bible, I would hear the voice of my reference, or I would hear the echo of my Bible teacher in my Reformed school, and they were very anti-gay, sexist, basically, and very heteronormative. So, the Bible was a book of pain for me, because I didn't read the Bible, I read the echo of the voices of the people in the past, or I would hear my parents, you know? So then I started reading the Bible in English because it be to separate it from the voices of my youth. And suddenly the text came alive to me for I could finally read the text without hearing the voices and therefore the interpretations of others. And now I read the Bible in both languages and sometimes even part in Arabic or French. Mm -hmm. But I'll be honest, the Dutch Bible to me is study and homework. The English Bible to me is liberation and food for the soul. And does that, in a sense, because I'm wondering, because so many uh, languages are also very gendered to a yeah. lesser extent or more extent. I think Italian, for example, or French is a very gendered language. Mm. Of course, Dutch as well, but maybe less, yeah, less explicit. So. Yeah. Is that something that you encountered as well in, in reading all these different versions? Well, I'm happy there are... Uh, I'm happy that many Bible scholars now are trying to bring back the text to the more original form. So you find, for example, that words like homosexuality that were put in the Bible after 1850, mm -hmm. because before that there was no such a word, are now taken out of it again, because it's just, it doesn't do justice to the, to, the, to the text at all. It's a complete interpretation by, by humanity or by certain men who translate the Bible like that. Uh, and the English Bible is less gendered than the Dutch one. The fact that we have a non-gendered pronoun, thy, thee, is because they created one for the King James Version, a Bible out of 1500, because they understood God is not a he. In Hebrew, God is not a he. Uh, yet later, in later Bible translations, also in English, he became a he, which is so interesting because yeah. if you think about the Bible, old hymns, Thy faithfulness, how faithful thou art, it's completely non-gendered. And the Dutch doesn't have a good pronoun, so the Dutch Bible always had he. Um, so for me, sometimes it's, it's best to read very old translations or very new ones, mm. 
that do way more justice to the text. And one day I hope to be able to read the Bible in Hebrew because that's a very interesting uh, way of reading the text as it's full of feminine connotations and non-gendered connotations of God and also of the humans within the Bible itself. At the start, you said that a lot of people find your reading quite provocative. Yes. I can also imagine that you face quite a lot of resistance. No. No? Oh, the funny, that that's me. A funny Tell thing. me more about yeah, it. Yeah, that's the funny thing. You would expect me to get a lot of criticism or even be called crazy. As I really don't know any other artists in the Dutch art and culture scene or the theater world or museum world or higher levels of literary, um, literary world here that is so religious or so openly confessing faith. Um, but I find this society in loss of spiritual nutrition, mm -hmm. in loss of moral guidance, and in loss of leadership and vision. And our generation doesn't have the same bad connotations with the church like the generations did before us. We didn't run away from church most often. It were our grandparents, right? So I find people way more interested and open to it and more accepting and they don't have this, the same trauma as their great parents or their grandparents did. And rightfully so. I understood why people run away from church so hard. I cannot blame them. Mm -hmm. I did myself at some point. And then I came back and then I run and I have some kind of love-hate relationship with churches. But the thing is, every time I speak about God and love and the Bible or the Quran for the matter, which I also studied, or faith in such a relaxed, happy, liberated way, it is attractive to people, and it's interesting and intriguing, and it liberates them too, to at least discuss it. So downstairs in the, at the bar, people were telling me, I disagree with you 100%, but I have questions and I want to know more. And they were happy. And I'm not personally insulted by the disagreement. You don't need to agree with me. Mm. I don't need to comfort you. Either you will get the revelation of God yourself or you won't. It's not up to me. I won't be so boastful and pride, proud to say I can comfort anyone. And it's not my job. It's only my job to reflect God's light. Well, if that brings people close, good for all of us. Because it gives us new ways of talking to each other and meeting the other, right? It's, it's both for both of us to step out of our comfort zone when we meet beyond our beliefs, belief systems and, and, and doctrine. So... I find people actually quite intrigued and quite happy because many people actually love to talk about God. Even the atheist needs an, an, a notion of God to be an atheist because where are you an atheist for? <laughs> you know, like, so it's, it's about actually about bringing people together then? It does. It does bring people together and even the biggest atheist is happy to meet a theist because then he can discuss is atheism. Like, there's no use of discussing atheism fiercely with someone who says, yeah, but I don't believe in God either. Then you're done for, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, actually, I'm bringing, bringing atheism back to life and then destroying it. No, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, so, uh, I, I expected a lot of criticism. And, yes, I would get criticism every time I would take it personal. So, when I take the unbelief of someone else personal, mm -hmm. you will get strife and I will be hurt, you will be hurt, and la, la, la. But if I truly believe that there's something bigger than me, I'm at ease. And the more I'm at ease, the more you can be at ease. And we can discuss this in an open manner uh, without being insulted by the different standpoints or views. We already have to round up almost, but I would like to I, I end with a final question because you said uh, at the start of your lecture, mm. we have lost love. Yes. Um, in many ways, it was only, not only romantically speaking. Yeah. Mm. What would be one proposal for, for finding back love, for finding love again? So, if I had that answer to the question, of course, I, I will be the next Mandela or Gandhi or anyone else. But I think one of the first steps in finding love as a society again is really giving the other what you would have liked to receive yourself. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive, the Bible says, and do unto others what you would have done unto you. It's also called the golden rule. And I think there's a huge truth in that. You want to be heard? So ask questions to someone else and listen. You want to be treated with respect? 
So speak with respect about everyone, even if they're not present. You want love, so give love to anyone you meet. You want joy, so smile to people and make a joke. I really think what comes like what goes around comes around in that mm -hmm. way, and it's a very deep spiritual, but also like scientific principle. And if we want to be more loving, then we should really think like, what do I miss most? Okay, it's this and this and that. How can I give that today? I think on that note, uh, we'll end. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for your keynote. And You're um, very welcome. Looking forward to hear more of you. Thank you. All right. <laughs>